In this lecture segment, we'll look at the core function of Minishell, run commands. This is where all the fork, exec, and pipe calls happen. Run commands walks through the commands list via this uh, big for loop starting on line 22 through 168. And what this does is it forks and execs a child process for each command. As it does so, it keeps track of any pipe or file from which the next child process should read, and it creates any new pipe into which the child process should write for the next command. The two important variables here in FD is the FD file descriptor of either a prior pipe, the uh, read end uh, of a prior pipe, or a file from which the new child process should read. And out FD will be the file descriptor of any pipe or file to which it should write. And a note on diagrams for this discussion. There's a lot of tracking of open file descriptors in code like this, so I'll use white rectangles, like mini shell here, for each process, including the parent, to show open file descriptors. Within each rectangle, we'll have the executable name and perhaps seven or so file descriptor numbers with arrows pointing either to for writing or from for reading, whatever that file descriptor represents. Now, I won't show FDs as variable, variable boxes, uh, by the way, since at least within the process space, they're merely numbers. So we start with just Minishell and its three open file descriptors. And we'll walk through the same example command as for read commands, keeping the list that was set up there in mind. Now consult those notes if you need a reference. Repeating the linked list here would clutter the diagram uh, too much. So with our model command in mind, there, we can see that the uh, line 122 for loop points CMD to each command in the command list in turn. For each command, lines 123 through 127 do pre-fork setup. 123 through 124 here open a file for input redirection if one exists, if a command in file is not empty string, and if there's not already an established input file descriptor, for instance, a pipe from a prior command. In that event, NFD winds up taking the uh, file descriptor of the open file. And in fact, in our case, that will be true for our first command, right? Less than emails.txt. And so we will then put in an assumption that uh, the open FD winds up being number three. So NFD will be three. And we will have input.txt uh, or emails.txt as the target of file descriptor three. Then lines 126 through 127 deal with the possibility of a pipe. We set up a new pipe if there's a command after the current one. And again, in our example, that will be true. Pipe FDs always has the file descriptors of the pipe to the next command, not the pipe from the prior one. So the only remnant of the pipe from the prior command is in the NFD variable. And we don't have a prior pipe yet, but that will have the file descriptor of that prior pipe's read end when necessary. For now, let's fill in in our pipe FDs according to the current example. So we'll zoom uh, FDs four and five are open, and then we have a pipe going to the next command after the one we're about to create, and that that will be written to by five and read from by four. So we got six file descriptors open here already, don't we? And now we're ready to do a fork. Now, assuming a successful fork, line 129 there, we will now have two processes, both with the same open file descriptors. I'll add child to the name of the second so we can tell them apart. <clears throat> As you can see, we have a real forest of open FDs now. We're going to need to uh, trim a lot of these, and we'll be doing that. So let's look at the parent process code first. And that runs 
on lines 132 and onward. 132 increments a count of the number of successful child processes in command count, so we'll know how many wait calls to do at the end. And then we do some FD trimming. Line 133 closes in FD, which as you may recall is 3, since we're not going to be reading that, not the parent, only the child will do it, and the child already has his copy of that FD. And then lines 134 through 136 deal with the outgoing pipe to the next command. And we're going to close its right end because it'll be the child who writes to it, not the parent. Now, we will record the file descriptor of its read end, which I guess in this case is FD4, in NFD for the benefit of the next child who will be reading it. And that brings us to question one. Why did we wait till here to do lines 1 through 34 through 136? Why do we wait on this cleanup until this point? The new pipe was open all the way up at line 127 here. So nothing's been done to in FD or to pipe FDs in the interim. Could we have moved these uh, three lines or four lines, 134 through 137, up after line 127 inside the while loop? And coming back from a pause there, the answer is we need to remember to think in terms of two processes. Now, the parent isn't using pipe FDs or in FD directly, but the child created by fork will use both and therefore they both had to be correct until the child had been forked off. The fact that the child's code is lower down, down after this else here, may make it seem as though the child will run later, but it runs right after the fork in parallel with the parent, and it will need the original NFD and pipe FDs duplicated by that fork. Once the child is fired off with copies of those variables, then the parent can safely update NFD and close pipe FDs one to prepare for the next command. So here's question two. Is line 135 in particular just good housekeeping or will omitting it cause some bug? And what bug if so and, and why if uh, why not if, if not? And so then after a pause here, omitting it leaves an extra writer on the pipe, the parent. Per earlier lecture segments and in lecture questions, this means that readers in the pipe will hang rather than get an EOF, since the extra writer implies the possibility that more data will be added to the pipe. Now, this is repetition, but it's worth the repetition. It's a very common error. So when, not if, everybody does this at some point, when you make a mistake like this, causing read hangs on a pipe, look for extra open writers on the pipe. And then question number three here. What bad thing would happen if we dropped line 133? And a hint here, it won't happen right away. It's a subtler problem. Again, coming back from the pause, well, it wouldn't block the pipe. Extra readers, which is what we'd have here on the pipe, are okay. But it would tie up a file descriptor in the parent. And it would tie up a new one each time the parent created a new pipe and assigned its read end to NFD. You're only allowed so many open FDs, so at a certain point, open and pipe calls would start to fail for lack of available file descriptors. This is a classic nasty bug in these sorts of programs, where lots of file descriptors are flying around and being duplicated across fork calls. Keep very careful track of your file descriptors in such code, and be sure all of them get closed at some point. So, turning to the child side now. Lines 140 through 143, first move any NFD, which could either be a file redirect, as in our case, or an incoming pipe, to FD0, so it becomes the standard in. We'll change the diagram here. We're going to wind up with FD0 closed, and this NFD moved there. Okay. And after that, lines 145, through 151, 
determine whether a special output file descriptor is needed and store it into OutFD if so. 146 through 149, check if there is a next command. And if so, then we should output to PipeFDs1. They copy PipeFDs1 to OutFD and close our copy of PipeFDs0 if there is an outgoing pipe. We won't be reading the pipe. The next command will. And here again is an example of how careful you have to be to clean up those extra FDs. So moving back up here, what we just did was record the out FD5 and then uh, we closed our 4 here so that we are not reading from the pipe. And going back down to that code, Lines 150 through 151 check for output file redirection, which won't be occurring in our case, but if it was, they'd set out FD accordingly if there is a redirect output file, and they'd open the file. And here's question four for you, by the way. If we redirect to an existing file, we re redirect output to an existing file, do we add to the present file contents? Coming back from a pause... No, uh, the O trunk flag here means that we'll wipe out in the existing file contents in a redirected output file. And this is consistent with the real shell's behavior uh, uh, also. Something to watch out for. Uh, greater than my file effectively includes an RM my file as, as part of its function. So how about uh, question five here? Could lines 145 through 151, all this out FD preparation, been done before the fork? Why do we wait to do them in the child instead of just doing them before the fork as part of pre-fork uh, preparation? Coming back from a pause, opening out FD in the parent would require closing it in the parent after the fork, which is extra work. And even more importantly, we can't close pipe FD's zero in the parent. The read end of the pipe must remain open in the parent to be given to the next child. This kind of parent versus child reasoning, considering what has to be remain open in the parent, what can be done in just the child, etc., is critical to this type of code. Now, lines 146 through 151 created a special out FD descriptor. If they did, then lines 154 will detect that, and 154 through 157 will move it to standard out. In our diagram, because we did have a special out FD, we're going to wind up closing this and moving this to 1. And at this point, we're finally ready to do an exec. Our input is coming from a file, at least in this example. And our output is going to the next command's pipe. At this point, lines 160 to 162 here take the args list and create from it an argv-like data structure that's suitable for passing to exec vp on line 166 here. So question six is, follow lines 160 through 162 carefully and draw the data that results. In particular, think about what the target of each character pointer will be. Is that an allocated block of some sort, for instance? Coming back from a pause here, the answer is sort of an allocated block. The code creates a block of character pointers and points them to strings, but the pointers point directly to the value fields of the arg structures in the args list. So the strings here are not independently allocated character blocks, though they are part of larger allocated data blocks, the, the arg nodes themselves. Now, execvp doesn't care where the character pointers point as long as they lead to valid strings containing the command line arguments. So this is fine. Of course, question seven, we're not doing a free of that C alloc block from uh, line 160 there. Um, that's a storage leak, right? So how should we fix that? And coming back from a pause here, if I got you thinking about how to do a free call, you fell for a sort of trap. 
We're about to do an exec VP call. This will wipe our memory clean, including the entire runtime heap. When you're about to be brain wiped, you really don't need to worry about tidying up your runtime heap. Okay, now let's ask another one here. What if the executable that we're about to run is like one of those we've written in the past that chews up its command line arguments, messing them all up by modifying argv, for instance? Won't that mess up the value fields of the args list over here if that happens? Coming back from a pause there. So uh, did I get you a second time? The args list is heading for the big bit bucket in the sky. After line 166, it's not going to exist. Now, note this does mean that the OS kernel must do some careful copying of whatever data CMD args is pointing to, moving it down into the bottom of the runtime stack of the new post-exec process image. This is one of the tasks of the exec system calls. So here's yet another question for you. Why does CMD args get used twice in the exec VP call? Second parameter is the argument list. Fine, but what's this first parameter for again? Again, coming back from a pause, remember the first argument is the executable file name. Now, this happens also to be the first command line argument. So we get it via star CMD args. So now that we've done the exec call, the diagram should show our child process running grep and uh, drawing input from emails.txt and feeding output to the pipe. And there we go. Now, the next question is an important one. Take what we've done so far and extend it through the next iteration of the loop, including FD diagrams and all, up to the point where we exec sort. Coming back from a pause there. So taking this step by step, what we have first is that the new CMD is going to be for sort. That's what we'll be working on here. And then lines 126 through 127 are going to create a new pipe. And it will probably have FDs 3 and 5 open on it, since those are the ones available in the mini shell parent program. And that would mean, of course, that 3 is reading and 5 is uh, writing. <clears throat> now, we're going to do a fork. And after the fork, we'll have a second mini shell. And it will have the same FDs open as the parent did. Thus, all six of them. Getting a little bit crowded there, isn't it? So we're going to have to trim. Come down a little bit here. And the parent closes its in FD. So we'll be getting rid of the four output, sorry, I should say input from the pipe. And that's that guy there. And then the uh, parent also closes his pipe writer to the newly created pipe. Thus, and assigns the reader of that pipe, which recall was three, to NFD, which will be saved for the next child process. To use as its input when we get there. The mini shell child also closes and reorganizes quite a number of its FDs. It will, first of all, dupe FD4, which is the old value of in FD as of the fork, recall, onto FD0 and closes FD4. So let's do that. Let's see here, we have FD4, and we'll just dupe that onto FD0 and Close the existing FD0, and then along the way we also closed 4 as part of the diagram. So that's what we get after those two lines. And then uh, it saves FD5, the out FD of the pipe, uh, the writing FD of the pipe, 
uh, and to out FD, and, and then it uh, closes pipe FD zero because it's not going to read the pipe. So let's see here. Pipe FD sub zero is three, so we're going to close three, and we're going to copy five into out FD. I guess it already is five, so that's cool. And then finally, it dupes five onto one and closes five. And that means we get this over to here. And then the one that we had before, if we can get that, is closed. And finally, of course, exec then runs sort. And as you can see, sort has a input from the first pipe and an output to the second pipe. And that's ready, of course, with NFD being three, uh, ready for the third command to read from that second pipe. And that's about it for read commands, or for run commands, I'm sorry. And this big loop sets up as many child processes as needed with pipes between them, redirection arranged, etc. And they all run together to perform the command line. Now, question 11 real quick here. Uh, one last concern. Won't Minishell reprompt the user once run commands returns? What if the child processes are still doing their work at that time? Might the new prompt get mixed up with any output from the old prompt? Coming back from a pause. Uh, the critical answer to that question is down here on lines 170, 1 through 2. We're going to ensure that run commands doesn't return till all the child processes have completed. So there's no problem. Last final point on what's turning out to be a long lecture segment. Apologies. Now that we've seen how standard commands are executed by run commands, uh, this is a good time to discuss a special category of shell command. As an example, let's look at how logging out of a command session works. Real shells often permit you to end the login session with a command logout instead of just hitting EOF. Question 12. Go to a standard Unix command shell and try running which logout. What happens? And given what we've seen so far, what would you expect logout to be? Uh, would you expect logout to be a C program that the shell runs, like sort or unique, the ones we've been doing here in run commands? And if so, what would its code look like? And back from a pause. What you should find is that which logout fails because logout is not a separate program. If it were run as a separate program in the child process, it would have to kill its own parent. In principle, one could design a program to do this, but it would cause a sudden disorderly end to the shell and an orphan child process. Instead, the logout command is directly interpreted by the shell, not run as a child process. And this illustrates an important general idea in command shell design. Some commands, called shell built-ins, are performed directly by the shell. Usually these are commands that affect the shell's program state directly, like whether it keeps running or not which is something hard or impossible to do from a child process. And so our final question, number 13. Modify the shell main program so that logout works as I just described. It only takes two lines. Coming back from a pause, a simple way to do this would be to add inside of the first if statement of main, the uh, test if uh, strcomp arg, uh, commands args value is logout, check to see if you've got a logout command, and just do a break and drop out of the loop. So that completes our discussion of mini shell. Now a real shell has a lot more to it, but these under 200 lines of code cover the core concepts and are a good model for any code you might write that sets up cooperating processes that communicate via parent arranged pipes.